increased uh, instances of domestic violence as well as uh, outsiders having women abuse. There is an increased uh, prevalence of HIV, but again, we need to understand that while HIV, we say, is uh, because we took with both partners, but women are much more vulnerable to HIV because of their anatomy, the body, the, the way their um, uh, uh, organs are made, they are much more vulnerable than men in HIV. Uh, on safety and security, this is Muzaffarnagar rights, and uh, Priyanka also referred to it. Uh, this, after three months, we had done a detailed assessment, and what we found was that within three months, in a state of mind where people were afraid, shocked, sad, there were 200 marriages organized for adolescent girls. Something to understand, marriage is normally some, a very happy occasion, but here, why was it happening immediately after riots? Because people were scared about the safety of their children, and they were getting them married off, and uh, there were so many plans for another uh, Sunni camp for marriages to be taken place. Uh, this is about the Tanzania 2000, uh, July 2000 in Burundi refugee populations. Some relief packages that we normally have, floor mats, tarpaulins, some dry rations and everything. So because of certain funding constraints or some certain logistical challenges, even HCR had to stop supply of soap for some time. Normally we expected that supply of soap stopping would mean poor hygiene and spread of diseases. But what the survey showed was that there was an increased rate of girls having sex in an exchange of soap. Something so simple, but the implication being so strong. Uh, lack of soap was also be, uh, reported to be a strong factor for an increase in uh, sexually transmitted uh, diseases. <coughs> the other impact of disasters on women is also on access to education. There is an uh, increased level of dropout from schools. One is that when the buildings are uh, damaged, many a times some education facilities set up far off and women are not feeling safe. Girls are not, girls don't know feel safe going so far. Um, there are, if, when you set up temporary schools, you try to look for volunteers who can do teaching. Normally women don't volunteer and it's all male teachers there and girls are really hesitant going to those places. Uh, there are no toilets and teenage girls, adolescent girls do need toilets, so, so during their menstrual cycle, none of them would go. Uh, because of the sexual violence, there are lots of pregnant teenage girls in IDP camps, and those girls with babies, they can't go to school. So there are so many factors making them more vulnerable. <clears throat> Again, access to water hygiene sanitation, uh, Whenever we had this uh, rapid assessment done in Siddhupal Chok, Nepal, post earthquake, and the discussion with men, all everything came up as an issue except for the needs of women. So things are again reinforcing that men just don't see that there are certain needs for women which are so critical. This is a uh, temporary bathroom or bathing space, you can say, in the Fudagar camps in the Um According to UNFPA, the impact of health now I'm talking about, during Syrian crisis, many women lost their children and they, just because they could not afford the cost of neonatal care. So, so many things which go completely unrecognized, uh, overlooked. Women have been fa uh, found more vulnerable to heat waves. One good thing is during drought, women are uh, found to be more resilient than men because of their body fat and uh, the way they are made. But in most of other disasters, it's, uh, the number of women who died during Indian Ocean tsunami compared to men, we, we have so many reports that clearly tells you that women and children are at more higher risk. <coughs> On food security and nutrition, this picture is showing, if you can uh, see the, the chi child in between, it's an 8 year old boy. So you can understand the level of malnutrition, no one can guess that this is the age. Uh, so they end up reducing their food intake because they are supposed to be caretakers and feeding others in the family. So they, when they are reducing their intake and if they have their lactating mothers, obviously it has an impact on their kids also. <coughs> now I'll be shifting to impact of disasters and men. Uh, sexual violence against men and boys is in reality in armed conflicts is much, much higher but completely underreported because when we are saying that women are hesitant in talking about their sanitary needs in front of public, men, because of the way they are brought up, are extremely hesitant in saying that something bad happened to them. It's against their ego, the way they are brought up, they just won't talk about it. <clears throat> Both men and boys are vulnerable in war zones. Uh, however, boys are additionally vulnerable when it comes to refugee camps. Uh, on Boshan Health, uh, 
There is evidence that men have reported much higher number of heart attacks and stress. So there are psychological issues with men, again attributed to the way they've been brought up, the expectations from them as the breadwinner, and we'll come to that later. I'll, I'd like to give examples of Somalia, where Somali men aim to have something called raganimo, which can be translated as manhood, and from, from the very beginning of their childhood, they are uh, uh, oriented that how to behave like men, never to cry in public, never to share their problems, things of that sort. And even when they grow up, the way their wives behave actually is said that you are you have be, uh, better manhood if your wife is behaving better. So everything is around men. <clears throat> Uh, access to education again, when the schools are uh, displaced or far off, uh, even boys have an impact. Sometimes there is risk of abduction. Uh, when pa pa parents are unable to pay school fee, boys start to engage in work. Girls drop out and boys start taking some work if they are really interested in a uh, job, but this also has an impact. Uh, on food security, some, a factor when wives die, because we are seeing there are so many deaths of women and children who is left is men who, uh, because of the way their uh, upbringing is done, traditional roles have never known how to cook, how to store, and therefore they are facing this problem uh, in, at the time of nutrition also, they, know, they don't know how to manage. <clears throat> now I'll talk of what are the norms, societal norms, which are creating these problems. <clears throat> uh, I, I just meant to refer that men have a change to when women die and they, are, uh, they get to cooking and all, so I won't uh, talk of the societal rules. Uh, women are primarily responsible for collecting water for household. It's all across, somehow there's a norm. Uh, so when there is a disaster and there's complete water shortage at times, women have to uh, walk for five, six kilometers just to draw water and come back, which also exposes them to various kinds of vulnerabilities uh, and safety risks. Uh, women are expected to feed other family members before eating themselves, and men are expected to earn and provide for their families. Both these norms have an implication when it comes to disasters because norms change. Men are the decision makers in household and communities. When they are the decision makers, all the planning, community meetings, early morning, disaster management planning, it's men who do the planning. So what is the result when the early morning is issue, warning is issued? Women don't even know how to interpret it, what to do, because they have been completely excluded from this planning. So there is an implication of this norm also. Uh, household chores are responsibility for women. Again, a factor that I uh, talked about, that men don't know how to do these things, so if it comes to them to take care of household post-disasters, they are really affected, there are stress levels which are high. Men are breadwinners. Uh, I'll go straight to the example. During 2014, following crop failure due to drought, more than 1,100 men committed suicides in Maharashtra, Telangana, and Jharkhand. 1,100 men committing suicide just because they were not able, able to provide their families with food and that's a societal expectation that it's men's responsibility. So we really have to understand that. <clears throat> now how do we address this? There are lots of frameworks by various organizations. There's the UNOCHA, ADAPT and ACTSI. Uh, there's uh, in CARES and Science from CARE, I'll just uh, share what we are doing during the preparedness planning, which is a scenario-based planning. Uh, we do integrate uh, what can be the gender uh, scenario and then look at how the response should be made. I'm glad that Dr. Priyanka brought the topic of aid workers being uh, dominantly men, but also proud that in care we always have at least 50% women starting from the assessments to relief distribution, it's always aid workers. I'm also here not because I'm a gender person, but, but because I'm heading the humanitarian section. So just to <laughs> say that it's not so bad, it's still... Uh, Care International has developed a gender emergencies guidelines, Oxfam has 16 minimum standards, all these things which have been developed by humanitarian agencies after a lot of thinking, after working at grassroots level are things which are practically possible and doable. Uh, one of the challenges that uh, relief workers often say that when you are in such an emergency, people are dying, where is the time to look at what are women's problem? You know, you have to save lives, so don't talk of gender assessment. How can we address this? There's something called rapid gender analysis, where in peace time, when there's no disaster, you do a secondary data analysis and understand gender norms and needs, which you build on further when the actual disaster happens. That's an RGA. Uh, the minimum initial service package adopted by IAC, NDMA, Sphere, UNOCHA, that also has uh, a lot of things which you can do. And it says that MIS can be implemented without an assessment because it already is based on enough analysis. So even if you have no time, just implement it as simple as that. 
There's another tool called Gender Marker. IASC also has a Gender Marker tool which says whenever you're designing a proposal or program, just review your proposal on gender. Uh, CARE has just modified it saying, don't just look at your proposal, but how you're also implementing it. So it goes beyond just the proposal part. <clears throat> Conclusion and recommendations. Uh, as in the beginning, I said that most of the databases are gender blind, so we definitely need sex and age desegregated data in the databases, in assessments, in reports. Uh, disaster management planning, <coughs> both for government and humanitarian agency. Gender integration into scenario-based emergency planning is required, so that at the time of emergency, we don't waste time in thinking what to do, what not to do. Uh, men and boys are important partners in gender transformative humanitarian action and we must recognize and not ignore them. A change is only, hap only possible when all of the people realize it. If most of the women are feeling it and are already converted, there's no point in again telling them that you know you have to be empowered because the difference happens when everyone understands there's a need for a change. <clears throat> Organizations should develop standard operating procedures on how to do no harm while actually integrating disaster, uh, gender uh, in their work. Addressing issues of time, I already mentioned that there are various tools that you can use so that at the time of disaster, you don't have to go for a detailed gender assessment. Myths should be implemented and gender marker is something that I am advocating for. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Celia, for a very interesting presentation. You very well brought out the issues of masculinities especially when we are talking of gender issues, both men and women matter, and especially when you're looking at disaster response and risk reduction, how both men and women can play an important role. Integration of anti-combatants. I've got facts to the enforcement. Enforcement is a local governance by state in India, and not for The second major aspect, in my opinion, is education. If you can educate the society, boys particularly, they go more to the school, maybe to some extent we should be able to address the psyche, the mentality, the mindset. The last but not least what uh, Dr. Shah said, self-help groups. Women can help themselves there by no means equal sex, as is talked about time and again. And uh, one of the things that uh, brings me, uh, it's, it's just a minor observation on my part, in the armed forces, we are taught to prepare for a disaster. But similarly, we talked about community involvement yesterday and today. So while the community is being sensitized how to prepare for a disaster, how to reduce the risk of a disaster, how to mitigate a disaster, one of the things that the women groups can tell in the village, in the top levels, is how a woman should provide a kit for herself if the need comes if you are in a high risk zone. If you are in a zone, it gets flooded often, if you are in an earthquake zone, there are certain guidelines given what do we have in an emergency case. So why don't we have that kind of education done at the lowest level? Please prepare a bag, have these things kept in there, your sanitary needs, your undergarments, whatever else is specific to women. I'm not trying to say that the aid agency should forget women. All I'm trying to say is why not help yourself. Before I open it, I'll just briefly comment on your important point about again asking the women to take care of themselves. Like as a society, we want to see the balance between both men and women. We have an example of where Unifem prepared a kit where they had kept a sanitary napkin. But the religious leaders of a particular state, I don't want to mention, they refused to take that kit because this is seen something as polluting. So the problem is it's not about educating. It's a, again a lot of things which are religious sentiments coming to. So, uh, we need to again see culture specific, religious background and any other. So uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, my co-presenters uh, to comment on this. Because you said you were with the army uh, uh, disaster. Do you sort of give directions or do you have them understand the situation regarding gender, women's issues to your... Well, unfortunately, I am only, uh, uh, what should I say, I am only tasked to provide the aid, so whatever comes to me, I take it to the people who are in need. I do an airdrop, I, I take it to the airfield, from there it goes by roads. So I am not involved directly in any of these uh, preparation of the kits in terms of going to a lead camp. Maybe you should have that. Maybe uh, there are uh, women uh, regiments of uh, CRPF and other uh, police forces which can be deployed at the camps. 
But once again, it's a, it's like this, it's a state which has to take that initiative. The rules are there. It's the enforcement which is lacking. How do we go about I didn't mean to say that the woman should take care of himself. I'm not saying living it to God. But rather than depend on somebody, you know, why not be prepared? I'm not saying the aid agency should not do that. That's exactly the point, you know. Uh, instead of just presenting the ideas to the world of intelligentsia, the need is to debate it. And that is the reason why we are here. We are debating the manner in which the entire paradigm of disaster, discourse of disaster has been happening. As you just said that you just you have to just provide the relief packages. What we are demanding is that those packages should take care of the needs of women. Now, as ma'am just mentioned that a lot of people protested against keeping the sanitary products within the package, the aid thing. The point is that everything starts with an idea. Until unless we don't debate, we don't know what that idea is, it becomes a problem to come up with a solution. Yeah. And, and you said that, uh, uh, the starting thing you just said that times have changed. If time, I'm not sure if times have really changed. No, I, I think you're taking me the wrong for no, no, When I said I prefer it with us, I prefer it for everybody in the house. I have the street by case, I have water bottles, I have everything in that package. And so when I'm preparing it. But the issue is, the issue is, just to make a small increment, we're living in a country where more than half of the population lives below the poverty line. And perhaps it's very difficult for us to even imagine the fact that I traveled 5,000 kilometers in Bihar during the elections recently. And there were hundreds of families I met who do not even remember when they last cooked down. Okay. The problem with people like us who live in urban spaces is the fact that we don't have the exposure which an average Indian should have about the problem that people face in villages. Now, it was in, indeed a, a very disturbing experience for me to actually travel into the poorest of the poor household where I'm sure that I was about to meet people who, do not, who did not even know when they last cooked the meal. So when you do, I work for NETV as a detail government affair, and when you take the camera around in a household, you, I invariably would tell myself that perhaps they have not cooked meal at home for last I don't know how many days. So here we're talking about the most vulnerable section of India, which doesn't cook every day a meal, right? Now, they don't, many of them don't have clothes to wear if you move into the interior of the travel area, especially in Madhya Pradesh that I've worked on. So the idea of them having a kit, because a disaster will happen one year or two years or three years later, we don't know. Uh, I'm saying that the idea is exceptionally good. Everyone should have that. But the fact is, who will do it? Now, then the question will come that we have to actually formulate a policy. Because the state can't favor a, a, a group of Indians in one district or one area. You have to actually formulate a policy where you chalk out a list of disaster prone districts in India and then identify people who live in disaster prone areas and the poorest of the poor who need perhaps more help from us than others. Your idea is very good. The issue is that the state has repeatedly failed to protect the lives of people. It's good. It's a good instrument that you are suggesting. But the fact is that who will supply <coughs> these kits to hundreds of millions of people? And that is one challenge that India has faced today. And I can tell you that I've met hundreds of villagers who were telling me that even when the policies are in place like Mahatma Gandhi Narega Yojana, in, in my own village, in Purvi Champaran, uh, many Dalit people told me that the Mukhya told them that the Mahatma Gandhi Narega Yojana has been stopped in India, so he can't give, they get them any work. So I told them the finance minister has allocated 36,000 crores in this budget. And I cover rural development ministry. So who, how can anyone say in India that Mahatma Gandhi Narega Yojana has stopped? So a 33,000 crore purpose scheme in India, the biggest in the world to create rural employment, this has been becoming dysfunctional on the ground. This is a state of a scheme which Parliament has approved 33,000 crores to spend on. What you are indicating is an idea for which I do not know when the time will come. Because no, it's first not just an idea. Actually, Disaster Management Act, which takes a very holistic approach of preparedness, right in the Act, now it's 10 years or 11 years, uh, even the most affected states where you have Every year, recurrence of floods, whether in UP or Assam or uh, Bihar, you'll see that there's no preparedness before it. Still a response center. 
So if yeah. anything happens, people respond to a while, and we have our students also who are working in these areas say that there's hardly any response. Prepare and that's the point I think you also made that the enforcement is the key. Mm -hmm. The fact is that first you have policies that may yeah. not be implemented on the ground. And One second, Alicia wants to just on your suggestion again, going back to what she said, there is a need for debate, there is a need to understand what the needs are. Solutions are not so simple. Sitting here, we may think that we should be prepared to take sanitary napkins. We need to understand what are their practices. They use a cloth, they wash it, they use it again. That's when they have pre privacy. When they're outside in camp, they don't, don't have a space to wash it. So it's not that they can keep it in the pool. What they use cannot be used anymore once they are exposed to the public space. If the NGOs can be brought into all this in terms of poor applying the aid, apart from the governmental agencies, which can be like enforcement. Right, we have a few more questions. So Mr. Anita Singh, and then, and then, then we'll think collectively. I have failed. As a male, I have failed to protect you. As a male, I have failed to provide you that aid. So why are you failing yourselves? Why are you not helping yourself? I have failed you. I have failed you. Have to provide, the state will have to so provide again, you. Again, again, let me do the semantic analysis. Again, no, this is a very interesting dis uh, discussion. Actually, we need to have this discussion. We need to have these forums where men and women come out in the open and talk about you know, how they respond to issues. So I think it's a very healthy thing you know, that you are responding. Uh, uh, the second thing is that I was not putting this up in public because I was scared to do that because I have failed to protect you. Again, you are treating yourself as the face of governance. You are not, but that is what is the underlying thing that you, when, we, when they say male, it's that section of governance which actually behaves like male. It's the masculinity which, which uh, is an epidemic in the larger part of governance. It is not male. There are hundreds and thousands of males who are working with women in the way they want to be, you know, treated. It's not that. But the way, you know, a man from the forces responds, you know, I have failed. You know, it's, no, no, it's I, again I, I individualizing. I as a man and not as a man in uniform. <laughs> I, 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 I failed even as, as a man. man but, even as a but, man. But I, I didn't know I, I would get down in an academic discussion on this. I'm not prepared for that. But demanding as equal citizens, we are not. No, you might get that. Ma'am, ma'am, please, please. Okay, can I just ask? I, I just have one more question. I just want to ask something. I'm saying this is a healthy discussion. You know, this is a chance that. Uh, that very few men would get, you know, you may go back and start speaking yeah, to me in, your, in your organization. You would be a trend setter in your organization if you come out of this hall and talk to your people. And you would also be changing, you know, the perspectives of other men because this is a very good thing. You must talk and please come up with the questions. That yeah, usually are. gender discussions get very hot and debatable. No, now, the point that. is, we need to go with a better understanding being gender sensitive. And when we go back as to what we have learned from each other, and that's what is, I think, very important. So take it in a very healthy manner yeah. from all the discussion. I, I think uh, it's been a yeah, long way. Yeah, we also and conflicts and bad, problems bad, in all our relations a lot with vis-a-vis the, vis -vis the well, there's 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 a, officer, officer. There's a academia also. I, 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 okay. Yeah, there's a question yeah. at the back. There's a question at the back. Yeah, I'm a bit anxious because there is very less time and I want to, yes, uh, I want to yeah, yeah, have yeah. some uh, other points also in the discussion. Uh, I'm Mandar Vaidya and I'm representing an organization called Radar India. And we have been doing a lot of capacity building <coughs> across India as well as in Southeast Asia on disaster response as well as on disaster risk reduction. Now, uh, all the presentations were, were very thought provoking and I was delayed I was able to relate all the presentations to my experience of working in real life too, situation. I have seen almost every response since those floods till Kashmir last year. And I have seen that every year there have been new women headworkers coming in and responding to the situation. Now in Kashmir it was a very different situation where uh, college girls took initiative and they volunteered and did a lot of things. But I agree with Ms. Ja, that we have a lot of frontline workers coming in as women frontline workers coming in as disaster responders, but we really have very less disaster managers, and that will definitely make some changes. 
Now the challenge here is that my organization also creates a roster as a roster of <coughs> humanitarian workers, uh, which has a list of around uh, 300 members in India. Uh, and we have been trying to enrich this roster with more expertise and more uh, more number of women workers here. Now, uh, there has been a lot of challenges and we are not successful in that. Okay. Okay. There was one question at the back and we will come to Manita. And the last point which I, uh, I want to make here is that in few years back we did a survey with civil society organizations in coastal Andhra Pradesh with 13 organizations and we found that 35% of uh, staff members of CSOs are trained in disaster management, but out of those, only 2% were there. Women were there. The rest of all were men. Now, the question which I have in my mind, and uh, it again refers back to the hot discussion which was happening before, is that can we think of proposing some spaces where this discussion can be taken forward? At CSO level, as well as, I'm very glad that JNU is there at academic level as well as at the government level. Because I have been part of various NDMA meetings, various SDMA meetings, and where these core issues should be discussed, they never get on discussion. So can we propose some spaces where we can get... We are taking it up <coughs> at uh, panchayat level. And the last point is that when we advocated that more number of women workers should be trained in disaster risk reduction and disaster management, everybody, including government sources as well as from CSO sources, said that from where investments you come. There is no investment, committed investment for this type of capacity building. So we also need to think about how do we really bring in capacity building funds or capacity building investment so that we have more number of women managers in disaster response. So Thank you so much. Gendered budgeting is something which has come up very recently and we have started thinking on those lines. I hope there will be a lot of changes. Any question at the back? Yeah. We speak a lot about the uh, impacts of uh, the gender impacts of disasters on women. Uh, although I would like to uh, uh, focus on the post disaster recovery and rehabilitation uh, because uh, very little of it was touched in all the presentation. So uh, I would like to ask the importance of uh, the institutions of the state and market, particularly because they are the most key, important key players in the post rehabilitation. So, and this question comes from the background of that of the Gujarat earthquake. Uh, so, there is a scheme called uh, widow pension rehabilitation uh, scheme by the government of Gujarat after the earthquake. And for the beneficiaries to even access the scheme, they needed a male member. So, the scheme is supposed to be gender aware and gender sensitive, especially for women in the long term recovery was not. So, my question is what can we do about it and how do we go about it? Very important question. What we raised a long term rehabilitation it all comes to women. And when you look at livelihood revival, from my own study, I could say that uh, not much importance is given, especially uh, for rural women. The livestock is such an important economic generation activity, which is not taken care. And many a times they don't then get any work or any kind of money, and they are left behind sitting at home, not able to generate any income. Do you want to respond to this? Uh, in fact, these are, these are some very important structural barriers which need to be taken uh, into consideration uh, in the situation of disaster, post situation of disaster. And this can only be, according to me, resolved if you bring in women participation in discussing, bringing these issues and participating at all levels, right from the first stage of, say, uh, mitigation to preparedness to kind of eventually, you know, uh, keeping women at position of decision, decision making capacity, because there is somebody else deciding. So these issues are never, uh, uh, so the situation of this disaster is also marred by patriarchy like other situations that uh, we women have to. And I'll just quickly give you an example. You're right, it's not happening. Mostly government aid finishes after relief to take you back. But my organization is yet so to continue. I'll give you an example of our work in post photo cycle in Vishakapatnam and Vidyanagaram, where social monitoring committees were formed to try to work more than 50 percent women in each village. They were demanding, they were planning, they were monitoring the happening. This is paying for the women were included in that women change from uh, person who was getting paper to actually demanding, hiring people to work under them. 
such changes never ever it as in rightly yeah. pointed there is a gap there and we need to work on it but mostly humanitarian agencies are working government is not doing it so much so we just a second. I think I'll, I'll give it to you. And I think all the all the experiences that we have. It is my personal view that academia talking only to me it is not acceptable at all. And uh, people actually wanted to ask, really wanted to ask businesses, well, what, what have we, we been doing? Why aren't we intercepting in a situation where we have, have we ever proposed to the government that we would be training the district uh, machinery or let's say IS officers or whosoever with this kind of a uh, perspective that when this happens, this should happen. This is this is the way. So uh, have we ever approached? No, it's not. That we have, that we have always, uh, that we have always been doing actually. No, no I understand. Sir. No. Just a quick point. Yeah, not this one, but, but generally. But the point is, are we training those people? Academia trains everyone. Yes. Academia is training everyone. No, it's From, really yes, yes, yes. IS officers are trained, trained by academicians. Who is trained? Academicians train everyone. They take the photos. That's a paradigm shift. See. Money. One second, one second. Let me take control of this situation. Actually, academia's role are many, not just uh, teaching or preaching. What I feel, we all involve ourselves in many other activities and try to be on the spot to do whatever we can, along with agencies, organizations, state and all. Now, uh, yeah, I, I think there's been a long wait on, from this gentleman. My question is to Mr. Sharma. I have to say, the machinery has made the different machinery. And you mentioned that it was there in the room. For 5,000 pieces, you are going to distribute. What kind of business model do you have in mind? Because it is getting them free, it is getting them too difficult. That is very funny because we don't expect them to buy that machinery. I am not focusing on business at this stage. My fundamental concern is that 10,000 tons of needles are there and we have to mobilize that, first of all. We, uh, I, I was not saying I was involved there, but few people, they installed a large plant and it uh, became a failure because of absence of a viable business model there. So uh, that, is, that, is, that is why we went for the smaller machine, basically, hand-held machine, the kind of petal-based machine. So uh, it would not be a major cost to fund that kind of a machine. And uh, we will distribute that. Then we want those widgets to be utilized at the household level first. And then, then once the value chain grows, we would be collecting those widgets. We would be creating a value chain. We have already proposed that value chain. So uh, that would go to you know, industry. And that is how we will try to direct that, basically. At this moment, uh, there is no lack of all <coughs> This one. Very important point of what he raised is in any natural disaster, you see a lot of uh, debris remaining there, which can be utilized, like in Andaman Nicobar Islands, all the trees which were felled were asked to be collected and used as a firewood. firewood. But then uh, the interventions were such that the cylinders came and the forest crews didn't permit that as to is it the debris or are you cutting the trees? So how do you make a, a distinction? So that, that was the case, but... Chapter and social vulnerability, experiences of Dalits in India. So um, I don't have data sets and all, so um, I have not kept PPT for the purpose of making it more clear through my presentation or not through PPT. Uh, my uh, central argument for today's discussion is that uh, discrimination during disaster, especially uh, in case of Dalit, is extension to daily lives. Whatever we are uh, being reported by media, that, that discrimination is uh, also repeated in, in the time of disaster. Pre and post disaster situations are the same. Second premise on which uh, the central argument is based on my presentation is that technocentric approach on which net, uh, natural disaster uh, theory uh, is based has paid little to uh, the social vulnerability aspect. 
technocentric approach has taken very little to uh, the cognizance to the social vulnerability. Uh, social vulnerability. Whatever social inequality or stratification in society is there, it has not been taken. By, uh, it has not been taken by the natural disaster theory, which is which is based on the technocentric approach. Existence of a varied and a stratified social structure has compelled the Indian society to experience the challenges in accessing equality for all. And this equality uh, is replicated in time of disaster also. When, when relief operations are being carried out, uh, if you see the accessibility of relief material for the Dalits and accessibility of relief material for others, you will find the stark difference. If you see the organization of Indian villages, you will find that the power relation within the village is devised in such a way that you will find the power, uh, powerful people in, within the village, they are centrally located. In case of flood and in case of minor, minor disaster, they are lesser affected because they have built their houses at the upper end of the uh, upper edge of the uh, that landscape. The reality of caste discrimination continues to harm the lower caste population at the time of disaster in accessing the uh, in accessing the relief material. So disaster for Dalits reflect the double geopardy, where they are uh, fa facing the wrath of natural disaster on one hand and caste discrimination at the same time. During disaster, they are fishing in relief camps and during distribution of uh, uh, relief materials. That is on the other hand. So it's something like double geo party for the uh, for Dalit population. We just deliberated uh, before lunch. We just deliberated the case of women during disaster. This is this is some something somehow related to that only. How the social realities are shape, uh, shaping the debate, uh, shaping the debate of accessibility, and how this is uh, placed in the uh, scholarship of disaster literature. With the emergence of social vulnerability approach inspired by the work of uh, Okafi and Weisner, the disaster theory sees a para paradigm shift from natural hazard approach given by White and social behavioral approach inspired by the work of quarantine. Early, as early as 1976, Okafi uh, and others argued, that removal, uh, argued for the removal of term natural from the disaster. An argument uh, for this removal of term natural from the disaster was that various countries and various countries have replicated the best practices and they have reduced the uh, impact of disaster. Various, di uh, various impacts of disaster we are seeing in developing country, uh, developing country and specifically in India are not seen as equal damage maker in the West. They have, they have good practices and they are able to mitigate in a better manner. So, the basic premise for the uh, basic premise on which his scholarship was based, based that when you are talking about uh, disaster, disaster is not an equal term. When everybody uh, is experiencing uh, the disaster on different different terms, when we are talking about natural disaster, some of the natural disasters has been contained. Just like drought, if you have good canal system, you you are. Uh, lesser affected by the uh, droughts and all, lesser affected. You will be affected, but you are lesser affected. In India, disasters in general impact the lower caste people heavily due to the, their social vulnerability. In the social order of society, they are placed at the bottom of pyramid. And unpreparedness to cope, of the, cope up with the same situations. Reason behind exclusion is the existence.